Shalom, and welcome to the newest edition of our Eov, or Job, in-depth series. We're going to call this edition Sporting Wisdom with the Leviathan. I hate saying that in English, so pardon me as I go Ashkenazi on you. Sporting Wisdom, Sporting Chachma with the Leviathan. For the sake of the rest of this class, Leviathan is the Ashkenazic pronunciation of Leviathan. Um, what do you call the Leviathan in, in the in modern archaic English, like the uh, the great uh, end of days serpent, like water sea serpent, as mentioned in Job and Psalms to be exact. Um, again, for the duration of this class, it's going to be called the Leviathan, which is the Hebrew of Leviathan. I don't know what a Leviathan is, but I do know what Leviathan is. So again, let's, with that little halfway intro, the Eov in-depth series uh, enhanced by, by Proverbs, and we're going to call it Sporting Wisdom with Leviathan. The chapters of Eov, and again, I don't want to say Job anymore, it sounds too much like Job, so let's go ahead and keep uh, with Eov, and you're going to notice I'm going to refer to Proverbs of King Solomon a lot. And I don't want to use the word Proverbs anymore. Let's go ahead and call that Mishle. Right, so the words you need to know for this class, Mishle is Proverbs. Eov is Job. Chachma is Wisdom. Leviathan is Leviathan. And some other words that you might want to take note of. Eitza is Counsel. And Seichel is the Higher Intelligence. Um... I think that's about it. There's more words we're going to use. Uh, niflaot, or mufla, uh, for the language of pele, or wonder. Imuna, which means faith. Tefila, which means prayer. Iun, which means investigation. And I believe that's about it. Now, we're going to use the English, but just in case I slip, uh, also nevua, I don't know if I mentioned that, it means prophecy. If I slip, there's your index. You can always refer to the beginning of the class uh, for translations. I'm going to use the English as we go, um, except for obviously Eov, which is Job. I'm going to I'm going to use Eov and Leviathan in place of Leviathan. Everything else, I hope and endeavor to give a proper translation. We're going to be focusing on chapters uh, chapter 42 in Eov, verses one through seven primarily. Um, and in, in Mishle, Proverbs, we are going to focus on chapters 1 through 9. These are all a condensed version. Um, I'm attempting to weave together a certain tapestry to give a very specific viewpoint. And this is where the class effectively begins. The viewpoint is one that I think that I've been working on probably my entire life, and I think you have too. It's the proverbial it. It's the meaning of life that you have been searching after. Uh, it's what the Ramchal says, that you know it in your heart. But the problem, which has always been the problem, we just don't have the tools and knowledge and wisdom and experience and life and mastery of life to articulate what it is that we're trying to get at. Call it the meaning of life. Call it, you know, what is God, where is God, why is God, how is God, when is God? All these, these questions that really, in, in philosophical terms, come under the category of existentialism. And if anybody is interested in existentialism, you probably suffer, like Eov did, like I do, and like you probably do, from existential angst. Right? That's one of, my, it's one of the more uh, yeshivish kind of uh, jargon words that I think we can all appreciate. Um, it sounds big, but when you think about it, existential angst, uh, it's, one of the, it's a great concept. Why am I? You know, what's it all about? Why me? Why does this always happen? Uh, you can call it Jewish karma, for lack of a better term. For those that don't, you know, I, I know people don't appreciate the term karma, but until you know what it is we're looking for, a lot of people think that you, you know, the Torah in Judaism has a type of karma. Right, the type of thing you say, why me? Why has this always happened to me? And Eov is one of our guys that's saying, why me? Why is this happening? King Solomon and Mishle, why me? You know, the, the Proverbs themselves speak of 
of a why me mentality. Thus, you can say that it all boils down to when you reach a certain age, I think it's inevitable by, by recurring life's patterns and sequences. There's the, the dynamic of the search and where Judaism and Torah differ from all other faiths and practices. Judaism slash Torah actually trusts and expresses that you will find. Right? This is actually a verse in the Torah. Right? From you know, you're gonna be scattered to the four corners of the universe, and there you will search for Hashem your God, and you will find him. Right? This is this is one of those really bombastic verses in the Torah compared to other faiths. Other faiths, I think it's it's wishful thinking that you're gonna find something, and King Solomon says as much, you're not gonna find anything. Right? The search will make you believe that you found. But you won't find. Torah is the the true path, so to speak, because it has the the vessels, the articulation, the tradition, the God involvement, the prophecy, the dedication, the literature, the world, where searching is accompanied by finding. Um, that is, I think, the best part of Judaism. That's the best part of Ger. It's the best part of the meaning of life, tree of life, you know, the Adam and Eve story. You know, I was very bothered as a child. You you watch Indiana Jones and the finding the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and they found, uh, you know, I know it's not a kosher thing, but the cup and you know the third, the, what do you call it, the Last Crusade. But as a as a child in, in exile, I thought this is horrible. I grow up in Dayton, Ohio. Everything around me is false. And there's no chance of there ever being something true. And it's depressing. But King David tells you in the Psalms that basically from the until you're age 40, life is post-traumatic stress disorder. You're not going to find anything. It's hard. You live your body and your energies and your passions Right? You view women as an object. You view food as a rating of the pantry. You view, view sleep as curing a hangover. You view drugs as an elated experience. You view movies as a mystical getaway. You view school as a prison and education as a detention. So that's until you're 40 years old. From 40 onwards... King Solomon says you have 80 years of good years. Because if you dedicate your search by being a bal tshuva, repentant at a certain point, even the tzaddik, if you question existence, you know, at a good spot before 40, you are going to, be, to find things. That is what Eov and Mishle and the Tree of Life and the Repair of Adam in the Torah story, in the Chumash. That's what it's all about. You will find. You will search for Hashem with all your might, all your soul, all your heart. And the, the, the amazing revelation is, you will find. All you have to do is be dedicated to those first 40 years of hardship. And that is the hard part. And then just by God's design, when you hit around 40... You start to click and make sense, and you say, how come no one told me that this is what it's all about? And that's one of the amazing mysteries of life. I mean, I'll give you the answer my mother gave me when you, you know, telling me when you were 20, you wouldn't have listened anyways. Right? When you were 20, would you have listened to some, you know, gray-haired, you know, orthodox rabbi? Would you have listened to your grandfather's wisdom? If someone would have said, hey, uh, hey, Johnny, go pick up the Bible and go read the Proverbs. It's corny. No one's going to listen. By the time you're 40, those elders are on their way out. And you just want to, you don't want to talk about the meaning of life. You want to get to know them finally before they go. And then before you know it, you're now 60. Your kids are, what, 20? And they're not going to listen to you either. And round and round it goes. Maybe the truly specially enlightened will start to listen at, a, at an early age. And that's what King Solomon's on about. 
And that's what Job finds out with God and through his three and four friends. Job has faith. It's a question if he's righteous, if he's wicked. But when you look into the commentaries, Job is a man of faith. He doesn't really believe. He doesn't know enough to believe. He never saw anything to believe. He doesn't know the real world enough to believe. He reads the books, and he knows what it says, and he'll tell you what he's been told, and he'll say, God is great. God does these amazing things. God is wonderful. I love God. And life is great for Job. For, oh, sorry, I broke protocol. <laughs> Eov. But then things start happening to Eov. And God starts to test him according to the words of the Sutton. And this is one of the places where the Satan, the Sutton, is actually in Hebrew Jewish text. Ask anybody in Judaism, do Jews believe in Satan? And they'll tell you no. But yet in, here we are in Eov, and the Sutton appears. Ask anyone, do Jews believe in hell? The common phrase is, we don't. But in fact, we do. The Vilna Gon's commentary on Mishle says that hell is the, is the composite of seven levels altogether of Gehinnom, purgatory. Thus, when you've gone through a complete purgatory, that is the Jewish hell. And it is, notice, it is not eternal condemnation. Is there a Jewish heaven? There is also as well. You'll say, but no, Jews believe in the Garden of Eden, which is not heaven. Ah, but there are in fact two levels of Gan Eden, one which is below, Gan Eden Tachton, and one that is elevated on high, Gan Eden Elion. The below or lower Gan Eden is one that resembles this world, one that you would definitely not describe as heaven. But the, the rest of the, this talk is going to be dedicated, as we said, was sporting with the Leviathan, which is, for all intents and purposes, the Jewish heaven. The name of Isaac, the son of Abraham, his name is a derivative of this level of heaven. You might know him as Yitzchak, which comes from the language Yitzchok, or Yitzchok, to play or to jest. Yet in the prophets, I think maybe one or two times, or maybe you know, up, up to five, I haven't counted, Yitzchak is spelled with a sin, as in the word, as the opposite of shin, shin and sin. Uh, and that comes to mean Yitzchok, right? Which is a bit of a different word. It means to play, not just to jest, but to play. Then thus the name Isaac suggests jestful playing. The idea is, if you read the, the, the Proverbs, Mishle of Solomon and the Tehillim of King David, God is known to play with the Leviathan, right? God is jesting with the heavens. God plays with heaven. And Yishok is the, a term used in Mishle and in Tehillim, perhaps in the Prophets. I haven't looked at through, through the Prophets to see but we know that God plays on high. And that, that the definition of that is Gan Eden Elion, the higher Gan Eden. The, the, the Kabbalistic definition of that is that it resembles nothing of this world. So this is not actual what I'm about to say, but for the sake of analogy, if you have a couch, I would say you sit on a couch. And Gan Eden Elion you fly on a couch. And you say, well, it doesn't look like you're flying when you're sitting on a couch. And God would say, your thoughts are not my thoughts. If you had Kabbalistic knowledge like me, God, you would see you are actually not sitting, you are flying. So you see that, that well, this is why Kabbalah is a major uh, foundation and principle of learning when you're post-40, particularly post-40, because that's when life begins. When you learn the Kabbalah, you're learning a wisdom of a world not your own. A lot of people think that you would learn Kabbalah for this world, which maybe there is a bit of benefit of learning Kabbalah in this world. But the point is, is what you're doing is creating your schar, your reward for the world to come. And that doesn't mean you're looking for a bank account of gold and diamonds. Schar means, comes from the word reward. 
If you look at the etymology of the word reward, it's re-ward. Ward means to guard, as Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. Re means it comes back to you, right? The chair was lost and we recovered the chair. The chair came back to me. So you place your psyche wherever you project it to through your learning of Kabbalah, right? Your psyche is where you are. Your job is to place your psyche in the realm of righteousness, the Garden of Eden on high. If you fail or come short in that endeavor, there are levels. Let's say Garden of Eden below. Let's say you can go through levels of Gehenna. You can go through levels of this world. There are many places where your psyche can project to. But what you're doing with your reward, where you will go when you die, you're bringing the energy and intellectual capacity back into this world. Thus, you may have a benefit in this world, but you're really working towards your reward where you're guarding in the world to come, where your plot of land for you is waiting for you. And the ultimate goal is to recognize the higher garden of Eden, right? To recognize God's miraculous and mysterious ways. That is the essence of life. To recognize God's wonders, right? When I thought for 120 years I sat on a couch, whenever I would sit on a couch, in fact, I was flying, if that were in fact God's will. These are the hidden wisdoms of the creation, that which is totally unknown to man. In fact, the skeptic, for, pe for such people that don't believe in the Zohar, in, in secret societies, or Lamed Vav Tzadikim, or God's many m mysterious and miraculous ways, they lack a world view where God entertains man. That world view is, is not known to man Therefore, he denies God's wondrous existence. The Kabbalah is the awareness that God is the master of creation, that he is engineered by himself to be hidden in creation, and that which you see, your thoughts are not his thoughts. Right? When you thought you said, Hi, honey, I'm going to the store, you actually meant something completely different. Sometimes you can hear your subconscious come through. Right? And that's what King Solomon is going to call the real essential wisdom that you need to, to listen to, pick up, funnel into your being, and understand it on a level that it, you understand in real time when people speak with pearls of wisdom that only appear once as they are gleamings from this upper world of the Garden of Eden above where God's thoughts are not your thoughts. You can have a glimpse of of the revelation of God in this world. Even in, in the people below, even unbeknownst to themselves. And if you were to catch somebody in one of these moments of elated thought, you would say, hey, that was amazing. How did you know that? They would say, come to think of it, I don't know. It just came to me. The fact is, there, uh, there are moments of revelation in this world. There are moments of prophecy in this world. And the more you involve your mind in the matters of study, you will have the prophetic experience. Holiness is to be that which is without the impure layers of wisdom. For example, on the internet you'll see memes. And I understood, how does a meme come together? How does a person get Willy Wonka in a catchy phrase, and a rap star, and a cultural phenomenon in the news to come together in a very slick creative, cunning meme that catches your attention that really has a craftsman quality? The answer is because these people that are involved in memes, a less than holy endeavor, yet wisdom nonetheless, right? they're bringing a, a craft because their mind, you know, let's say they're watching TV and movies and you know, there's the idea of Willy Wonka comes up with the famous meme and, and famous sayings in the news, and famous musicians, and blah, it just comes together. That's called wisdom. Now, if you were to take that same art and discuss a Torah matter with a Torah scholar, and you say, hey, Rabbi Bob, what do you think about this particular matter in law or in Torah? 
all of a sudden you say, hey, that's just like in Yavama's 45b, the Rabbah says to Rabbi Nan, blah, 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 blah. You say, wow, how did you know that? He says, it just came to me. That's wisdom. Because you hear in each other, and the dots come together to form a miraculous picture. So sometimes when we speak, you set off a, 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 a chemical response in their mind. And they just blurt out, hey, that's like Rava. And you say, wait, did you say that's like Rava? He says, yeah. I was just learning in Dafyomi uh, last week that Rava said something along with, well, like what you're saying. And you go to the books and you open it up. You say, look at that. I didn't know Rava said this. This is what I was looking for. So I told you my wisdom. You just spouted some revelation. Prophetic revelation came back to me. You rectified my vessel. I taught you wisdom. And you gained from you. This is the rapport. In Torah it's called Shaklavataria. Back and forth, back and forth. It is actually a prophetic response based on a mastery of wisdom. When you speak, you are always doing this. You just don't have the Kabbalistic mindset to always identify it. But Kabbalah is part of creation, and even mundane speech, in English, let's say, has Kabbalistic undertones. For example, when you say anything relating to a vessel, in Kabbalah it's called a Kli. Now, even unbeknownst to you, you may be speaking about Kalim, although you think you're talking about a vessel, a picture, the picture is actually a Kali. That picture may be a highly condensed Kabbalistic sphere, but shrouded in what's called klippa, layers of the unholy. Thus, when you program your mind into Torah, you have the, the, the loss of the shroud and the veil, and you actually get a glimpse of Elukus, the divine revelation. Such is what we're going to deal with now. The more you recognize and polish these ideas, your schar increases. Your reward can increases. Again, reward is not your cha-ching bank account. It's reward. You're projecting your, your place just as Adam was placed on the land to work it and to guard it. You are projecting in what's called olam hahu, the spiritual world of all possibility where you will work and guard your plot. You may be the warden of Gehenna, you may be the warden of Hell, you may be the warden of the Garden of Eden on Low, you may be the warden of this world, you may be a warden of the higher Garden of Eden. Wherever you are, right, your thoughts are where you are, your real polished learning thoughts are where you are. And that's not to say, if I'm thinking of something impure, does that mean I'm a horrible person? No. It just means that you're not totally in the realm of holy. But that pertains only to this world. Where you project in what's called Olam Ahu, the future world of all possibility, holiness isn't really part of the equation. It's more of where are you, as God says to Adam, after eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil, where are you? It's more important to know where you are. So if you're talking about a vessel, but you call it a meme, just simply understanding that it's a vessel is the Kabbalistic knowledge. Now, what's on that vessel or meme, that already is a level of quality. Right? If you're looking at something that is immoral, then you know where you stand. If you're looking at something not holy but not immoral and actually conveying the truth, then the truth wins. So we look at the first verse in Job. Sorry, broke protocol again. <laughs> Third time is strike you out. Eov. I want to try to keep it with Eov. The, the first verse says, Vayon Eov. And Eov implored or answered. When you look at the word Vayon, there's a very powerful hint here in the Hebrew. If you rearrange the letters, it spells Eun. Now, if you remember from our vocabulary list, we said that Eun is going to be one of the words meaning in depth study. Eun is the first step of all steps in searching and finding. There are two levels that wisdom can come back at you. That of the left and that of the right. That of the female, that of the male. That of the general 
that of the specific, that which is far away, that which is close, and every other adjective, adverb, or whether ad whatever you like to put into that expression or mechanism. And here I'll give you an example. If I were to say that there is a British person in my vicinity, that might come across as a general statement. But somebody from England would say, is that the right word? England and British are different things. You have Scotland, which is different. Which neighborhood do they come from? Are they speaking the Queen's English or a different level of English? What English do they speak? Are they speaking English at all? Some say it's, you say, hey, 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 hey. I'm just making a statement. You're not American. You're not from around here. So I was speaking general. You took it <clears throat> to be in the ultra-specific. <clears throat> the Vilna Gone gives the example of Ben Adam. In the female sense, she says, a Ben Adam was here. And she just means person. When the man hears it, he says, well, who? What? Ben Adam? That's a very distinguished person. So now you can imagine the miscommunication you could have when she says, honey, Ben Adam was here. He says, why on earth do you have the plastic silverware and, and plastic plates on the table? She says, why not? He's Ben Adam. He says, are you mad? Ben Adam came to our house and you put out trash. Now they're going to get in a fight and they have a major challenge. Somebody has to be the victor here to put the funnel on their eardrum and allow the wisdom to come through. Somebody's telling the truth. And the formula goes into play. Male, female, Bob and Bonnie are out the window. It's war between two formulas, right and wrong, truth and falsehood. Was he right that a distinguished man came to his house as Ben Adam? Or was she right that a person came named Ben Adam? When they work it out, Kabbalah would say, don't read it that they are actually arguing and there's a contradiction. The Kabbalah says this is called Shtei Mazel Ke'echad. They both see the same thing, but they call it different. She understands Ben Adam from a, different, from a distance. She says, some guy. And her terminology for that is Ben Adam. He is a person, Ben of Adam. That is like the Bina female general kind of cool, hey honey, it's all good. He understands it from Yeshiva. Ben Adam is a highly distinguished individual who commands respect. I myself am a Ben Adam. That's why she married me. I know everything. I'm a Ben Adam. She says, I married a nice guy. Are they arguing? The answer is no. But the fact is, a reality came that some guy came to the house. He needs to understand, or she needs to understand, that either it was a distinguished person or it was just a person. For the sake of the argument, let's say that it was just a person. If it was a distinguished person, she would say, Hey, you know that guy, Fred, from down the street that's super rich and everyone loves him and he's a powerful guy? He wants to come over for dinner. We need to go buy new plates because obviously the plastic ones won't work. He says, wow, really? But to not hear the wisdom, to jump to conclusions that she's disrespecting some distinguished man would create an argument. It needs to be understood. So when they start to fight, he's going to get roused up. He's thinking it's a very important person. She doesn't know what he's talking about. Just some guy came over. Somebody has to hear the jesting of God in the upper worlds, beyond the Yitzhar Hara, evil inclination, where the Leviathan is sporting with God in wisdom, and we are searching and finding, why is she doing this? Why is she making my life miserable? Why is he, you know, abusing me? Why is he coming down on me? So that world of heaven, those pearls of wisdom are going to start coming through, <clears throat> like, 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 a, like a Chinese star in a ninja battle, before insults are thrown and damage is done, somebody must rise in wisdom to hear and receive from the other person. Then those dots will connect. Right? They fired enough bombs that you can connect the dots. It's not a distinguished person. We got plastic plates, some guy, 
Uh, no mention of anything important. He is in delusional fantasy land. Because he is mockbeed, diligent on a definition, and not seeing the other point of view. But is he wrong? No. Ben Adam is that for him. But he needs a repair. He needs to expand his vessels in a way that Ben Adam perhaps means something other than just distinguished individuals. In my home, in my world, it's distinguished people. In your world, it isn't. If I'm going to dwell in your world, I must see your point of view. Right? I must be able to express myself in your world and vice versa. That is the repair of husband and wife. To make his vessels betikun, repaired. Take his rigid behavior and open it up into an expanding, flowing, wonderful world. Where you can talk about things that would get dicey. But he has the ability to laterally express left and right. To, to, to see the greater point of view. I see that you're seeing and what I'm seeing are the same thing. There really is no contradiction. There is no no bear, no butting of heads in Kabbalah. They're just different places of schar. You're guarding the different worlds. She's in the place of Garden of Eden below. Because that's where Bob is. You weren't there. So you're reporting from a place on high, but my thoughts are not your thoughts. You weren't there. You're claiming to know that what she's thinking. But my thoughts are not your thoughts. You cannot know. So you claim to be on this higher Garden of Eden, but that's your Yitzhar Hara in exchange of the Vyasan. God is playing with you, but you have the audacity to think you'll play with God. That is your pride and arrogance, which God despises. You see how the wisdom goes. Once he realizes that my thoughts are not your thoughts, I must listen to incorporate what you say, then you find yourself. You will start talking to God. Your pathways of communication are open. Your hands are in motion. Just like now, the hands are in motion. You become expressive. You're alive. You're no longer dead. You are responding from hell. Now you're starting to come out of your Gehenna and find the portals of life. You're starting to come back to the real Gan Eden. The bliss of Shabbos is coming back in the home. Shalom bias, the peace of the home is coming between you. The love is found. You're back to life. You're breathing. You're sweating. Your heart is pulsating because you came to the truth. You are able to receive the wisdom of the playful jesting of God on high to the vessel of the woman that you married. That is a glimpse of the wondrous ways of God. Imagine all the time. Why are you cutting in front of me at the bank? You bark at the woman in front of you. You don't know that there's a wisdom there. And if you would pay attention and go beyond, investigate the situation. Don't just say people that cut in front of me are wicked. They need to die. Maybe there's another point of view. Maybe she was here before you got here, and the teller said, Hey, come to my counter, never mind the line, no need to wait in queue. And nobody else is yelling at this woman, only you. The guy that just came in at the end barking, Am I the last one here in line? Am I the last one here in line? If you'd hear your words, you'd say, Ah, I'm the last one, so how would I know? So God is coming through you. The prophetic experience of wisdom comes through you, but your evil inclination won't let you joust and jest with God as the Leviathan does. All within the world called you. Everywhere, every time, there's a place of investigation to search and find the truth, the wisdom, the seven pillars of wisdom in this world, the true philosophies of life, the meaning of life, the essence and the essential teachings of life to relieve your existential angst and actually enjoy a wrestling match out of fun with the Abishter. To allow God to find himself in your mixed up version of prayer that comes to life with your hands to allow there to be the revelation of God that he is one and his name is one. All of that, 
<clears throat> when you can come to some kind of revelation, <clears throat> it eliminates the faith that you have. No longer do you need to say, oh, you know, God's ways are wondrous. We, we, we know that God has blah, 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 blah. Eo suffers from the faith of God. His friends challenge him and say, what's with God? What is he doing? And Eo just tells over his Amuna. Well, it says in this book that God entertains man. It says here that God entertains in the heavens. It says here, but Eo, did you ever see it? Did you ever encounter the light of God? Did you ever witness a miraculous moment? Did you ever have a revelation from God? Did you ever have a prophetic moment where it just came out of your mouth and someone said, that's it, you're a genius. You say, what did I do? What did you do? You were, you were a vessel for God to come through to help a fellow man. On that level, some guy and a distinguished guy is, is indiscernible as just one guy. It's one person. What's it your business if they're distinguished or not? The bottom line is, why do you have plastic plates in your house at all? The point of the woman is to elevate the creation. It should be the good stuff 24-7. Go get a job. Because what you don't know is that she craves to have the nice china. And that's a whole different story of how to elevate the creation. The argument only happened on another point of view because you had plastic plates in the house at all. It only happened because you assumed that someone was cutting in front of you at the bank at all. That is your Yetzir Hara. Not all the time do we have the luxury of playing with God, or having God play with us, i.e. God revealing himself to us. Thus we are born and meant to sin. There is the Tzaddik, the righteous, that never sins, but never pushes the envelope, simply goes along with his emuna or faith. The Baal Tshuva he is a bit of a chutzpan, he's brazen, challenges the divine code and order, and he says, I am here, and I don't see God. He, 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 he treads on idolatrous tones. He, he, he basically infringes every um, pr transgression that exists to man. He's looking where he shouldn't look, he's doing things, but when beaten over the head, He's willing to look for the truth, to repent, to grow beyond himself, to go for the investigation. As the Vilna Gon says in Mishle, this is actually the Iker place of man. Not that he should sin, or should try it or endeavor to sin, but as the Alter Rebbe says to King Solomon's words, there is no man so holy that doesn't sin. You will make mistakes. Adam made mistakes. Job certainly made mistakes. As we, There's my transgression of protocol again. <laughs> Eov made mistakes. He lost his stuff. But if you notice, the Sutton never actually touched Eov. Eov touched Eov. Eov was the one who was challenging God, debasing God, arguing with God, fighting God, just totally off off center, saying, you know, mis misconstruing God's malchus and kingdom, blaming God, coming up with fantastic stories of Seichel and Ushi, the ideas of man about God's existence. And he would be seen in, in today's light as a master philosopher. Way to go, Yov. You are wonderful in your atheistic, atheistic expressive views of the universe. Tell us more how the Zohar is a forgery. And that was Eov, until he would be shriveled up and lose everything. Eov was meant to hit rock bottom. It was all going good for Eov, until he finally meant to find God. Let's just stop and look into this, the Eon in depth, hear the wisdom, hear what I am saying, stop and pray to God, get your mind going, Receive the revelation from God if God grants you favor. Is God wonderful or not? I've been through everything, he says. 
I on it, I've been through my Amuna. I know he's wonderful, but frankly, I am not feeling too wondrous right about now. At that moment, God speaks to Yov. Because he actually went through the process. He did tshuva. By the definition of God sporting with the Leviathan, there is tshuva as it was one of the seven creations created before creation. If there was not tshuva, you would not have the concept of the world to come in the higher God Aden. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And that's a fact. You must be able to think differently than God. Now, you may have an option to not think at all. If I don't think like, if I think different than God, then I won't think. And I'll just report what the, what the, what the books say. Does God have wondrous ways? Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, he did. And you're not wrong. And you are a tzaddik. You didn't sin, but you never challenged. You never brought out the expressions of really seeing, you know, hearing the lightning and seeing the thunder. You never had a chance to receive directly from God the revelation of his revelation. Thus we go along in our sinful ways, sometimes great, sometimes not great, looking for God to happen upon us like Eov did. To have a moment where God sports with us to leave beside the Yitzhar Hara, to kiss up and make up and not be enemies and see the same point of view and say, hey, that's kind of interesting. I like your way you think. I didn't see it that way, but now I do. And you know what? I'll go out and buy a nice set of plates, honey. Seeing the point of view of the other and then all that information comes through. Right? Why would you think that I would do this? Why would you think? And all the, the clarification, what you see, what I see, and we see it together, and we have a blissful moment. You are in a bit of Gan Eden. You're out of hell. You've done your purgatory. You're doing your tikkun. The words are coming to you. You're opening your soul. You're entering each other's worlds. You're not being offensive. It actually feels good. And when you have these moments... You bring a bit of God's light into the world. And you see people go on the same path you did, because now you're 50 years old. Or you're 50 years old, you're a ball eight, sir, right? You come to council. Like the, the daughters of Salafchat, the five daughters that inherited the land of Israel. Perhaps Moses was in a very unique relationship with them to receive their counsel after Moses divorced his wife Zipporah. And he was going to be banned from the land of Israel. The woman of counsel, the Torah of counsel, the man of 50 who gives counsel, counsel the same as Seichel, high intelligence, that which is undisputed. Right? The pearls of wisdom of having seen the absolute truth. I've been down that road. I've had that argument with my wife over the plates. And I say, why are you arguing with your wife? He says, because she wants, she wants plastic plates for some guy. You say, Bob, you're a smart guy. I look up to you. You have wisdom. You've taught me more than I've taught you. He says, thank you. Thank you very much. But you're an idiot right here, Bob. Because you're going what's called the patterns of Tom and Tamima. Right? You're, you're, you're naked here because you never got to this stage in life where you had to learn this. That's called Tom, simple. And your way is simple. I mean, you're not looking to know more to, than you know. You're not looking to say a, a placate experience with your wife where you say, okay, the Torah says, what can I do? You want to know and you want to see, you want to hear the divine revelation. So I'm going to tell you the counsel. I'm going to remove the evil inclination. And sport with the Leviathan, you and I are going to sport together and go fishing. Can you pull the Leviathan with the, 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 with the hook, pull him in, says the, the verses in Eo. The Leviathan has no fear. You now have no fear because this guy is giving you the counsel. That counsel comes from experience, from life, post-40 wisdom, from having been able to fine-tune your ear, to funnel the wisdom in, to have the conversation with enough people, you're able to give counsel that is undisputed, a pearl of wisdom, eternal truth, a portion of your reward, schar, from your 
gone Eden, either above or below, wherever you have projected, you are able to give a pearl of godliness in this world. You just made a wonder of God. You just sanctified the union of God in his name as one. You just celebrated in the holy temple. You just part partaken of the divine experience of the, the flow of bounty emanating from the Holy of Holies. Now, did you see it? Why not? Because again, we're speaking from faith here. But if you were to rise to the Garden of Eden above, where my thoughts are not your thoughts, can you have that revelation in Mazel, real-time emanation? Absolutely. But don't be willing to say that it doesn't exist. Don't be willing to say, I'll let the book say it. You must endeavor to witness the divine revelations of God. And if you say it from faith and you're determined to let it happen, don't be like Eov upset when they challenge you and say, tell me more about this holy of holy experience that you describe. I've never seen it. Have you seen it? And you're going to say, oh, I haven't seen it. Am I a liar? Is God punishing me? Now we're going to take away your honor. Are you really a rabbi? You have the you have the gall to exp explain that you've seen these things. He has made up levels. I saw what he did on the Midrachov. This guy's not even Jewish. He's not even from. I don't even know if he's human. I think he's from Mars. Now we're going to speak Lush and Hara. And all the eaters are coming out. I think you're an alien yourself. Don't go there. Let, like Eov, sit on it. Let the revelation come. Shed your body. Get rid of the, the comforts of the body. Of I have nice things. You won't talk to me that way. I feel good. I do this and that. Let it go. As the book of Eov comes to a close, you turn to dust and ashes. Like Abraham before everybody. Reminiscent of the paradum of the ashes of the red heifer. Let yourself burn. What does it say by Adam? How does Adam gonna re how does he return? to the Garden of Eden, whichever level you want to call that, to dust you, from dust you came, and to dust you will return. Eov, actually in verse 6, it says, it mentions the dust, the return to dust, and that's where it has to come from. You must pulverize the rock being thrown at your head and analyzing it to the point, what is the thing that's really bothering me? You break the rock into simple pebbles, pebbles to dust. You analyze the speck of dust, and that dust becomes the dust kicked up by the wrestling match of Jacob and the angel. More importantly, you wrestling at the feet of the rabbis, according to the sages of Ethics of Our Fathers, Pirkei Avos. You're taking the wisdom that God is throwing at you as rebuke. And you're trying to understand it and hear it. Please say it clearly. And your friends will... Well, they'll come to your enemies have gone. They've already thrashed you. Your acquaintances don't want anything to do with you. Your friends are all that's left. Maybe just your wife at home. You're saying, what did Bob mean when he said you don't understand God? And if you don't want to, if you don't hear it in those terms, then there are others. What do you mean when he didn't understand life? What did it mean when he didn't understand the guy at work? What did it mean when he didn't understand the trash guy taking your trash? It really means why don't I understand God is just playing with me? Why does my Yetzer have to make it into a war? It's not a war. It's called fun. And when you understand the point of wisdom that you internalize and you can express in the words, they're really saying you're not any fun. You're not fun to play with. You're not hearing our wisdom. You're not hearing our point of view. Because if you would have really listened the point of God's miraculous nature, always by the definitions of wisdom, comes out right when you need it the most. Right when you are lacking in your heart the understanding of God's miraculous ways. If you'd listen, you'll hear the proverbial, what'd you say? The wisdom comes every time. There's always the matter of counsel. Right? The, the female Torah is always there to say, hey, you might want to turn right over there and go check that out. Go check that out. But he who has a desensitized heart or an uncircumcised heart says, how dare you? Don't tell me where to go. But with the, with the circumcised heart, 
He who has a heart who feels, he listens to his heart. When he says, hey, didn't you ever think about listening to that? You know, you say it's wrong. Didn't you learn Baba Basra? You say, oh, I did. I did. You're right. That's what it is. The difference between good and bad as the tree of life of good and evil is like the skin of an onion. Between that which is you and you becoming aware of yourself versus God becoming aware of himself in the prophetic revelation. Putting your hands in motion instead of your hands in your pockets. Raising your Torah discussion of your mind, either here and now or with other people, rather than saying, get out of my world. I'm going to talk to myself, but you're not. You're actually not. You're like a trafe piece of meat. Just, you know, the, the blood is boiling in your body. To which the Vilna Gon on King Solomon says, you're not even meat anymore. You're just bread and water. And water can be made sweet artificially. And bread just looks good. You want to get the meat on the table and drink the wine. Things that have an essence. The pain is to go through life understanding these core concepts. It's all wisdom. You are a wisdom. Paying your bills on time is a wisdom you have not investigated. Eating healthy foods is a wisdom. Why do I like the wrong women is a wisdom. Why did I marry this woman is a wisdom. Why do I sleep until 4 o'clock is a wisdom. Why do I wake up at 6 a.m. is a wisdom. Why do I have this job is a wisdom. Everything in life that is good comes from a wisdom. You want to be a great athlete? There's a wisdom to doing it. Investigation. Proper technique of the wisdom. Hard work with the wisdom. Putting it into practice. Searching and finding. Search for the wisdom. Find the wisdom. That's where you find life. Finding life is where you find yourself, which is the same as allowing God to find himself. And you'll realize, I'm just right where I want to be. God's sporting with his Leviathan. I don't even know the Eid Sahara on that level. Life becomes fun, like a wrestling match. Your Yates or Hora, if you're not a good wrestler, your Yates or Hora will kill you. I gotta win, I gotta win in pressure. But the guy who is actually winning, he's having fun. He's never been better. He's smiling, right? The, the match is so pathetic, he waves to the crowd in the middle. Hey, Mom, let's go and take a picture. You say, how can it be he stops in the middle of a match for a picture? What an arrogant guy. He says, I'm just having fun. My thoughts are not your thoughts. It all boils down to Job, Eov. When it's all said and done, he and his friends received prophecies. Eov found the wisdom. He found life. He found the Leviathan that he mentions in the book. He found prophecy. We'll say today there is no prophecy, but there is. Look in the Talmud of Basra. There is the wisdom, prophetic experience there's peaceful experience, there's fun, there's friendship, there's all the things that you wanted in life as a kid. Where are my friends? Where's the fun? Where's the meaning? Where's God? Where's the light? Where's the temple? Where's the... It's there. Your Yitzhahor won't let you until you're older because you have to be old enough to receive a Kabbalistic understanding of the vessels of God Eden above. Because if you're just dwelling in this world, you'll never get it. It just looks like one big Yitzhah Hora if you're lucky. Not to mention hell and Gehenna. If you're a male, the wrong women will always be coming after you because you're always going after them. Right? There is, there is the nature of Pruravu, fruitful and multiply. You're chasing after something. Why? Because Mazel will say, women, a kosher woman is synonymous with the revelation of Torah. You think you're looking for a woman... You're really looking for the Torah. And you're looking for the woman that knows Torah. Why? So all the time, reality, and mazel, and God's will, and the Yitzhah Hara, and the wicked, and the righteous, and the return, and the search, and the fine, and the wisdom, and the simpleton, and the fool, and the Russia are all mixed in this cholent called the nefesh, the soul of man. 
And you either see it in a good way, the godly soul, the bad way, the animal soul, and your body says, let me put my place here until we're all 40, and then we'll see what to do about it when I start breaking down. Because until then, I just want to feel good and look good. Life. And you say, who wants to do that? I'd rather die. Then you just rather die. And if you're going to rather die, you better go in faith or ignorance. You just parrot what is true, not really knowing, or you deny the truth. And this are all the little things in life which go away, paradigm shift, when we go from the tree of knowledge of good and evil to the tree of life. It's all Yitzhar Hara until you come to your time with God where it all just makes sense and you're having a good time with the interactions of life with man, ultimately with God. It comes from, are you keen in finding wisdom or are you devoid of wisdom? Right? King Solomon says, a time for war, time for peace. Are you with counsel? Are you without counsel? Are you searching or have you found? Are you prophetic or are you dry? Are you in revelation or are you in depression? Are you in repair of Adam or are you in the sin of Adam? Are you in a, in a state of repair of your soul to express to the world the great and peace of God? Or are you clamored up and saying, I'm right and you're wrong? My thoughts are not your thoughts. But sometimes you receive the thoughts of God. And your thoughts go away. And to that we have to ask a question. The Talmud ends. <clears throat> Why does Job's, Eov's friends have prophecy in him? And the answer is, they were actually prophets to the nations. By Eov, they say he was of the Hasid al Musa'ulam, the highest praise for a non Jew. He's a prophet meriting the world to come. He's just found wisdom. And we say in the Talmud, but God wanted to take away his world to come. How could it be? We just said Job was great, then he's bad, then he's great, then he's bad. We don't know who he is. Why don't we know who Eov is? In fact, look at me. I don't know who he is. I keep calling him Job, and then I say he's Eov. Why does he have this mazel? The answer is, are you looking at him from afar or from close up? What is a chassid? What are the Ummu Sa'ulam? Is it an Akum? Is he a Ger? All these different points of view. That's what needs to be understood from Job, from Eov. If you look at him from afar, maybe he's not so great. Look at him up close, he's great. How you look at him is up to you. Do you want to solve your existential angst? If you look at him up close, how do you answer the Talmud? The Talmud wants to express the truth. And not everyone sees in the way you do. And the round and round it goes. And for that, we're going to conclude the class today. The EO series, Influence with Mishle, Sporting Wisdom with Luvyasin. The investigation, the deep, in-depth investigation of EO comes to a close. And with that, we're going to say, Why do the righteous suffer? The answer to that question, read Eov, and I suggest reading it up close. And you know what? The ways and wonders of God are miraculous. Why do the, why do the righteous suffer? My thoughts are not your thoughts. Try connecting to God and let the revelation be upon you. Have a great week, great Shabbos. Uh, I'm not sure if that concludes the Eov series. To me, I feel complete with it. Uh, we'll see if my thoughts, uh, how they compare with God's thoughts. So either to be continued, or I hope you enjoy the EO series. Thank you very much.